Hello and welcome to Pacific Opera Project stream of I Can't Breathe, a new opera from composer Leslie Burrs and librettist Brandon J. Gibson. I'm Jennifer Miller Hamill, host of Poppercast and your guide for this performance. I Can't Breathe had its world premiere this past February at Marble City Opera in Knoxville, Tennessee. Pop was one of the co-commissioners of this powerful new work, along with Marble City Opera, Opera Columbus, and Cleveland Opera Theater. And this weekend, it's receiving its West Coast premiere right here at the El Portal Theater. This opera features scenes with sensitive subject matter, including racism, abuse, gun violence, police brutality, and murder. Many scenes include loud sounds that are meant to simulate gunfire, a warning that these sounds, these events, could be considered upsetting to some. I Can't Breathe will focus on five individuals whose lives are forever changed after seemingly benign interactions go horribly wrong. It is these events, drawn from recent events in our country, that ask the question, how many more must die before we make change? And now Pacific Opera Project's presentation of I Can't Breathe. Good afternoon. I'm Josh Gar, Assistant Director of Pacific Opera Project, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our closing performance of I Can't Breathe at the El Portal Theater in North Hollywood. Uh, this has been a very special project, and uh, we are live streaming this across the world today, so welcome to those of you watching out there. Uh, we'll have about a two hour opera today with a 20 minute intermission, and then after, you're all welcome to stay and uh, we'll have a brief talk back with the production team and the cast right after. Uh, This is our next to last show of the season. We have one more coming up, Into the Woods at Descanso Gardens in the middle of July. We were just there last night for an event. It just gets prettier and prettier over there. Uh, Please come check that out the second two weeks of July. Tickets for that are going very, very fast, so get them soon. And then we just announced our season for next year. We'll be back here at the El Portal twice, um, first in September for a big production of The Elixir of Love, and then again in the spring when we bring back Super Flute, our version of um, the magic flute set in the world of Mario and Zelda and all of these crazy things. Uh, In addition to that, we're back at the Highland Park Ebel Club in January for a Vivaldi opera, Hercules sul Termodonte, one we've been wanting to do for a very long time, and then at the finish next year, like a a year from now, uh, we are back at Heritage Square with the Pirates of Penzance. It's a very exciting season. Uh, Season tickets are on sale for that now. Uh, So get those um, and we'll see you then. Thanks so much for being here. Please enjoy I Can't Breathe.
I started real clumsy on knees and elbows. But when the rhythms began to kick, I found my flow. Deep breaths, long fluid motions rooted to the ground. Connected body and emotions. Space and structure. Body and emotion. Man, I love to dance. Till my uncle called again. He said, boy, Wanna get somewhere with the girls? You gotta pick a sport to play. I didn't know what gay meant back then, but Hunk said it like it was bad. I looked up to him, I never knew my dad. Anyway, I gotta get something to snack on.
Target. Or maybe. Or maybe it's a Glock. Maybe. Maybe he's a made man. Maybe. Maybe he's been shot before. Not just some kid who swept a pair of the salon floor. Maybe he's the life of rather on tour. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs>
Well, I'm here with Josh Foy, conductor, music director for I Can't Breathe. Josh, thank you so much for taking a couple minutes to say hello. Sure thing, sure thing. Hello, hello. So um, I've had a lot of uh, conversation with the singers tonight about the, the challenges on learning this incredible score. Uh, what has it been like for you to really dig in to this score? I think the biggest challenge for me was how much the piece was sort of coming in droves because it was the, the, the ink was still pretty wet. On the piece, and uh, Leslie was a little late in turning it in, and we were getting the music at the same time as the other opera company, Marble City, yeah. was getting in, and we didn't know what we were dealing with as far as length, and so the original length, especially after the performance at Marble City, was around three hours. Okay. So the biggest challenge for us between me and the two directors was how do we cut this down in a way that makes sense mm -hmm. for the story to you know to sort of um, resonate with the audience, and so we surgically found little bits and pieces in each scene that makes it work and I think we've all came to a result uh, that works for everybody. 
Uh, the next challenge is try to figure out a way to work with the singers to help them sort of understand the vernacular that Leslie Burns wrote this piece in, which is more of like a jazz kind of funk style. So there's a lot of give and take during our <laughs> vocal uh, vocal sessions, uh, but I think, especially after yes, yesterday's result, it turned out pretty, pretty well. Yeah, and I want to get to that style that, that Leslie wrote in, because when I, I had a chance to talk with him and Brandon about three weeks ago for the Poppercast, and Leslie says that he refers to his compositional style as urban classical, and, and, and uh, he said that his influences growing up in South Philly, he said it was everything from the Motown that he listened to, to the guys that were singing doo-wop down on the corner, and then what he was hearing when he would go sing in boys' choir. Um, what are some of the elements that you hear of that in the score, like what we're going to hear in the live stream? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing for me, because I grew up, my dad's a big funk fan, and there are a lot of funk licks in the cello parts and in the bassoon parts, and that's the part I really latched on to. Uh, there are a lot of extended harmonies of ninths and elevenths, particularly with the singer sort of finding their way in there, which is why it's a little bit difficult uh, to work with them to make sure those harmonies clicked. Um, I also loved like the little uh, quotes that he has in here. So there's a little bit of South Pacific, a couple of other like popular tunes that I'm sure he listened to when he was growing up in Philly. Uh, that even the uh, the orchestra members sort of poked out. Oh, I like this lick. I like that lick. Or there's a little bit of Mahler here. There's a little bit of the South Pacific. So it's been nice to sort of oh find these little nuggets um, in his music, and on and top of that sort of see where he's coming from, um, which helped illuminate uh, the subject matter. What is your favorite moment in the show? Oh boy, it, it's so interesting because a lot of the show really comes alive with the staging that uh, Josh had put together, these beautiful sets, um, and then what the actors have brought into the piece. I, I have to say, there are two moments. The one with the mother, um, there's, a, there's a moment of real fragility that she has in that piece. And even though I'm like buried in the score, trying to keep everything in line, but I can feel that energy that she brings to it, which is fascinating. And then there's that early acapella moment uh, with the lover. Um, and I don't have to do anything, so I can just sit and listen and watch. But it's, it's so emotionally um, wrought in her grief. Um, and that plays out for the next 12 to 15 minutes in her scene. Um, it's fun. It was fun to work with Audrey in that moment, just to sort of to really bring that out. And it's just a great uh, joy to see and to feel it, because I'm usually buried in the score or pulled it off. Yeah. Well, Josh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And this is, you know, as we head into the second half of the show, can't wait to hear it. Thank yeah. you so much. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. So I'm joined by Jeff Peterson, who is singing The Scholar in I Can't Breathe. Jeff, it is great to you know, get a couple of minutes with you before, yeah, before things get, get started and get crazy. Um, so you're a native of Trumansburg, New York. Yes. Did I say that right? Yes. So where is Trumansburg? Trumansburg is in the middle of nowhere, central New York. Um, if you know where Ithaca, New York is, uh, it's right smack dab, center of the state, right in the center of the Finger Lakes. Um, if you ever watch The Office, Cornell University, that's where we are. That's where Andrew Bernard went to school. So what was it like growing up in a small town like that musically for you? Um, I was really, really lucky. I had a really great music program uh, at, my, at my high school. We had a small program, but really, really excellent teachers that gave us a great foundation um, in classical singing and sight reading and jazz and musical theater. They were just really, uh, really, really great, and we were just hungry to, to learn, so it was just wonderful. And you've been able to give back to that program recently, right? Didn't you go back there last year to do a special program with them? Uh, not with them specifically, but within the community, um, with uh, our local conservatory. Um, basically, we did, they don't do a whole lot of uh, classical music, and in the kind of in the pandemic, found a found a place to give myself an opportunity and to try to bolster uh, that new program there. So I did a uh, a recital of art songs and and song cycles of nothing but African American composers, both uh, past and present. Um, it was. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. I'd never scheduled all of that by myself before. Um, but it was really well received. Everybody was really excited. And we're looking forward to doing some more going, in the, going ahead in the future. So I was talking to Michael a little bit earlier about the stories bet with the thug and the scholar. I feel like there are a lot of correlations between those two characters. These are two young men that have faced adversity early on in their lives. They're finally getting to a place where they're finding peace and really like uh, purpose in what they're doing with their lives. They're following their dreams. And then it all changes in an instant. Um, 
what has that been like for you stepping into the shoes of the scholar and dealing with that? Wow, get it heavy before we even start the show. Okay. Great. <laughs> you know, um, for me, it was it was it was weird it wasn't it wasn't even you know we talk about when we when we prepare for roles and things how we how we have to slip into this mind and slip into this body and slip into this skin but this really wasn't very difficult um in this case i think the turmoil that we talk about and the adversity that we talk about is that in his case in the scholar's case is the sense of identity right is the sense of you know what makes what makes a black man what makes what makes a what makes a person inherently black what is that special quality that that brings out this wonderful blackness and for me, growing up in a, in a small town where I was literally in my class one of three black kids, um, you know, I, I was literally faced with that every single day. You know, I was thinking literally on the on the car ride over here how often uh, I heard the comment even, you know, it's like, oh, well, boy, I'm blacker than you. Oh, you know, you, you speak so well. And, you know, it's one of those, I, I still don't really understand that kind of, in in most of their defenses that that unknown that ignorant microaggression that that they was coming from um and i think in this case it's just for me it's it's very cathartic to be able to go ahead and try to examine that from a from an interesting place um and really share that there's a great line um that that he has um you know uh where where now I'm on the spot. What did I what was I gonna say? He says, um, you know, too many for too many black folk, this is the only black they know. All these different all these different slang words and and, and hip hop culture. I think that's a big part of it, but that's not all of it. And I think what he's done and the place that he's finally starting to come into his own is that that is an option and what he is is also an option. That is a human that is a human trait, that is a black human trait, that is him. Uh, inherently, so I think that's that's the most special part for me, and what we're trying to communicate going through this. And and that leads me into my final question for you: What is the biggest takeaway that you would love for the audience to go home with tonight after they see the show? I think what I really would hope that you would see is that while these are yes, uh, incredibly traumatic stories in the way that we're telling them, um, these are incredibly human stories. Um, whether I, th I think it would be really interesting, not that we should, but I think it'd be really interesting if we told these stories, you know, does it does it change whether or not we these p people are black or white or, or some other person of color? I think, you know, and I think it does. I think I think that with the inequity that we see, like with these with some of these characters that they face with some of the adversity that they face is not something that you would see in uh, in a traditional opera setting while yes in our big five and stuff we have a whole bunch of a whole mess of other issues looking at you tosca um <laughs> um you know i you know i th i think that's that's what i really hope i hope that we see this as as a really uh wonderful chance to engage on a human level Jeff, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking a couple minutes to chat with us and to chat with the pop audiences. Oh, thanks for letting me ramble. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm with Michael Washington, who sings the role of the thug in I Can't Breathe. And uh, it is so great to be able to have a couple of moments to talk to you in the midst of all the craziness that's going on with the show. Um, so you're a native of Long Beach, a local face, right? So um, what was what was it growing up? Uh, what did you do musically growing up? So I started um, in choir in elementary school. Um, I started getting into singing like that. Went through choir all all through uh, middle school and high school. Um, then I uh, went to LBCC um, for community college and studied music there. Transferred to Chapman um, for my undergrad, um, and uh, now I'm at UCLA in grad school, my last year. And um, I've just been singing all my life, really. So, and we were just talking a little bit before we got the camera going that you've got a big recital coming up before you finish. Um, what are some of the highlights that you're looking forward to on that program? Well, I'm really looking forward to my Sondheim set at the end, uh, doing a lot of his, his classics, Joanna, um, doing um, Being Alive, you know, and uh, a couple more really good ones. Um, 
and I'm looking forward to my my French art song because that's my favorite. I love French art song, and so it's gonna be it's gonna be a really good time, really fun fun uh, night. Now there are there are two common themes that I see in the stories with your character, the thug, and then with the scholar. It's being sung by Jeffrey. Um, these are two young men who have faced adversity um, all throughout their early years and have finally found a sense of peace and contentment in their lives um, with who they are and what they do. You know, the thug, for instance, you know, he's in a healthy relationship with his partner. He's making a living and he's enjoying his life, and then it vanishes in an instant. Um, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, um, he he went through a lot during his his childhood, and um, just uh, being in the present moment, having everything kind of just uh, together, um, you know, you you feel like everything's going well, and you know, in an instant, it's just it's just gone, and it's just so. Um, it's really it's really shocking because you you never know when something like that could happen and um it's a it's a very uh emotional dramatic uh story you know the dramatic arch uh to the to the um the scene so um yeah it's a it, it's really just it's shocking you know it's shocking what were the biggest challenges for you when you were learning this role and then bringing it to the stage well i think um the music is hard. <laughs> First of all, the music is hard. So um, uh, the biggest challenge was really singing it operatically, you know, um, within the certain jazz styles, um, because it's a lot of singing. It's like 20 plus minutes of straight singing. And so really getting my voice um, ready for all of that without tiring out, um, that was a big challenge. Um, you know, really getting into the character, um, there were some there's some elements to it where uh, I felt, uh, you know, I could really relate because uh, you know I come from a single mother, single parent household. You know, single mom uh, trying to do it. You know, <laughs> his mom was very problematic, but um, um, just like there's struggles. You know, you know, he says twenty dollars on the kitchen table like every week. You know, there there's times where that was you know my case in my life. So um, yeah. It, you know, really getting into it dramatically um, was a little tough, but musically, it's it's a big challenge, and you know, I'm glad I conquered it. You know, because it's a it is you know very rewarding when when it's all done. Well, I know that you've got your big scene coming up after intermission, so I'm gonna let you go and rest. But Michael, thank you so much for taking a couple minutes to talk to me, and I can't wait to hear you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Well, I'm here with Audrey Yoder, who's singing The Lover. Audrey, it is so great to have you here and to take a couple of minutes to chat with me about I Can't Breathe. Thank you. It's great to be here. So um, you're a regular face with Pop. You've done several productions with the company. Which one is this for you? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think this is number three, but they've all been since 2020, so in a short window. And then we're seeing you again next season. Is that correct? Yes, you are. I believe in January you will see me again. Okay, that's just a little tease for what's coming up. I am having a conversation with Josh in a couple of weeks about the upcoming season, so it's fine. It's fine. I don't know how much we can spoil, but you know. Um, so what has your journey been like being uh, cast in, learning, and now performing this show? Uh, it's always uh, an adventure learning a new work because there's not a lot to reference out there. Um, obviously the subject matter, um, was difficult when you started moving through it. And, you know, all my wonderful castmates have a lot of personal background dealing with situations like this, unfortunately. Um, but I do not, you know, I grew up in the Midwest in a very white community and, um, didn't, didn't really have any of those experiences or even have friends in my sphere that had dealt with those things until I moved to LA. Um, so the research on my part was uh, slightly more extensive and um, my role is loosely based around the story of Philando Castile. And so um, it was difficult, but I went through like those interviews with Diamond Reynolds, who was his partner and um, watching footage from that, which was, um, hard 
uh, you know, when you're dealing with real life situations, it's not the same as, you know, fairy tale worlds of, of, of opera that we generally um, encounter. So uh, her reaction and watching the way that she interacted with her daughter and those abrupt changes of emotion when you're dealing with that level of grief um, helped me inform my character choices for this. And, and that leads me into my next question, because your character, like the mother, we're seeing people that are dealing with the aftermath of a horrible event, um, rather than the event itself, as we see with like the athlete or the thug or the scholar. Um, how did you approach that sense of grief that comes along with your scene? Um, the grief was actually the easier part, the anger and the grief, but trying to find moments um, to juxtapose against that, moments of calm, um, moments of tenderness. You know, she still loves this person and doesn't understand how how to move forward without him. Um, so trying to find those small moments of peace within this like 20 minute breakdown, you know, you're watching her as she's losing, losing herself. Um, was actually the, the more difficult portion. And Sierra was really great to work with, Sierra Hammond. Um, and we talked about a few of those things and, and where to bring in those moments of stillness. Um, so th I don't know if that answers your question. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, because certainly trying to find the light in a dark situation, and, and as you were saying, trying to juxtapose those heavier moments with the lightness and the tenderness, that can be very difficult, but also necessary, as you were saying, um, as she's dealing with her grief. So, yeah. Um, well, Audrey, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate taking a couple of minutes to speak with me and with the pop audiences who are watching tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jennifer. It was great, great to speak with you. Yeah.
Every other week and never no one cared. I shoplifted when I could. It was rarely enough. 
I wanted to sell me, but I was too young. It was tough, too young for a job, too hungry to go without a sister to bend for. The streets had to bail me out. The only thing a young boy could do on the streets for cash is sell his innocence, sell his warmth, sell his Money that takes its toll. A downward, downward, downward spiral. A death row. Parking garages, classrooms behind closed doors. Understand anything, but you can sit out a secret. They couldn't put a name to it, but they knew I was different. Put on purpose because the older dogs liked it that way. I hit and miss or switch my hits. That's why they paid. My first life was then, early freshman year. Some older boy called me a nigger. Underpaid. There was 
he launched at me then. But Pearl got in the way. With his close fist, he broke her jaw. I flew in a rage. I was on him in an instant, a monster uncaged. For seventeen, but the grown man won that fight. Crackly ribs got me out, out like a light. Mom called the cops, laid everything on me for the assault and trumped up theft. I got thrown, thrown into juvie while I was locked up. Her and John moved away. I never heard from them again. No pearl as well to this day. Things were hard, dark for years. I bounced from this. This to that street life, a sleeping jail. All of that, only thing that saved me was love, gentle, funny. Smelled like tobacco and clothes, strong hands and my handsome man Pulling me back Pulling me back Back from the brink Again and again and again He knows of my past But not everything I hate Tax 
prices. Of course, I pay my fair share of calls. My margins are lean. Permit to set up here. Well, no, but I have an arrangement. You don't have to get ugly about it. I'm trying to make a living. What your name and your partner's name, both your best lovers. Put my hands up. Come on, man. I'm selling socks, not following a direct order. You treat me like I'm slinging rocks. I hate your cops. I sold stuff right here to officers before. I sold stuff right here to everyone right here. On the ground, on the ground, on the ground. In front of a store, I can't breathe. I'm down, man. I'm not resisting. I can't. Please. I can't breathe. You're on my chest. I can't get my breath. I can't. Please. I can't breathe. I can't.
Hello, we're hot, okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna ask the cast a few questions and then you all are welcome to ask your own questions or um, voice your feelings about what you saw today. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we definitely recognize that um, it's been a very challenging week and weekend in so many communities. There's been a lot of tragedy and loss um, along the lines of um, 
racial hate crimes. Um, and we're still you know, processing and learning and keeping our eyes and ears on what is happening down to um, with our community in the Laguna Beach area. So thank you for still um, engaging in art today and being brave to witness this. Um, we know that there are many parts that are challenging and not easy, but these are also reflections of the realities of what we face. Um, so we hope that the music and the artistry that you witnessed adds a little bit of beauty as we process and, and communicate that pain. So thank you for um, your willingness to still come today. Um, it's just one way that we can try to uh, speak these messages in a way that they are, they are meant to be heard. So thank you. Um, I think I would like to start, you know, tonight is our closing performance. So I thought I would just open it up if any of our performers or our production team would like to speak about what this experience has been like for them now that you're looking on the other side of it. Is anyone feeling chatty today? <laughs> They're tired. I'm tired. Um, but for real, I... Um, it just kind of caught up to my body today, and I'm like, what's happening? And then, you know, my daughter was like, well, <laughs> you know, you've kind of been doing a, a bit much, <laughs> um, you know, on top of just the, the tax that it takes to perform a, an operatic role just in general, and then the emotional weight um, of conveying these humans, these characters with integrity, um, you know, I tend to forget that that emotional pouring out that happens, you know, it, it, it takes a toll. So I'm feeling it. Thanks for your honesty. Um, I'm curious, uh, Sierra Hammond, this is her second time doing this opera. She was a part of the world premiere at Marble City Opera and then joined us here in Los Angeles with Pacific Opera Project. Uh, so this is the West Coast premiere and the second time it's been done. Um, and I'm just curious, Sierra, um, what about this opera called to you? We know a little bit about your story. You're welcome to reshare it if you'd like. But I'm wondering what, what got you engaged in it. And now you're directing. So what was that like? Well, <laughs> um, this opera, as I've, I've shared on the previous nights, it's very personal to me. I have one brother, and um, my mom said she was going to watch the live stream tonight, so I don't know if she's still watching, but if she is, just know I'm about to share this information. Hi, Mom. Um, there's three of us. I'm the youngest of three. My sister's eight years older than me. My brother's four years older than me, and I'm the youngest, a.k.a. the favorite. And so, <laughs> but when my mother was trying to have my brother, she endured two miscarriages. Um, and my brother was the one that survived. And so when every time I listen to uh, this opera, of course it's personal to me because I have so many friends that look like me. But tonight, I mean, when I was listening to the world premiere, I was basically crying every night. But tonight the mother got me. And I was sitting back there in the booth like, I've got a job to do. I cannot break down in tears and start wailing right now. But um, the mother is particularly special to me, not because she's also a soprano like I am, but because she just reminds me of my mom. Um, my mom is the one that's like, don't play with me. You know, I, I told people during intermission, like, I 100% believe that my mom, if I ever did anything crazy, she still would snatch me up today. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but the fact that I have one brother, and he's the one that survived, and if anything ever happened to him, that's my own, that's her only son and the only one that she has, she has no more. She's not going to have any more. <laughs> and so the fact that this opera speaks so personal to my life and to those that I know and to my colleagues here that have now become my friends, um, it's very personal. And the fact that I am blessed enough to be able to be a part of this production in any way, in any shape or form, is, is such a blessing, but also um, a story that I live daily, a story that I, I fear for my, my black brothers daily, my biological brother daily. He's very educated, but as we see in the scholar, that does not matter. 
what he, how well of a citizen he is, how well he talks, how well he carries himself, no matter what the color or how bright his melanin is, because he's just as bright as I am, or how dark he is. It doesn't matter. If someone sees him as a threat, his life is in jeopardy. And so that is something that, that I carry daily, and um, he does too. I can only care for him, but it's, it's different than actually living the life. And so this opera definitely speaks to that. Thank you. Um, one more thing I just wanted to chat a little bit about if anyone's feeling chatty. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are opera super fans out there, but one thing that is traditional, I use the word traditional, is that um, opera singers usually come to their first rehearsal already with an awareness of the music and already with an awareness of the role. They've practiced it. They've maybe done some coaching. Maybe they've done that role many, many times because we tend to like to repeat operas. Um, and so, you know, that's just an expectation. And this music is very challenging and this piece is very new. So I'm wondering if anybody on the stage wanted to speak about their process for preparing for this opera, being that it was new, um, that this subject matter is also current, feels very current, um, and what that was like. Thanks, Michael. Hi, my name is Michael. I played the role of the thug. Um, this music is hard, uh, <laughs> um, and um, it took it took a lot of uh, time and and patience with me because usually I learn stuff pretty quickly, and um, sometimes I get frustrated because uh, there was a difficult passage in it. Um, but you know, you break you break all these sections up. You know, my part my section is like twenty plus minutes long, and so. You know, I was breaking it into like 10 plus sections and um, just going at it. And, you know, Josh uh, gave really good uh, MIDI files and I was just like listening to that every day. Um, and that was, yeah, it was really, really tough. Um, but now it's so rewarding to like, just like complete the whole thing. Cause you know, now I know I can do it. Now I've done it like, you know, three times already and you know, more, you know, so, you know, it's a, uh, I feel very accomplished that I got through this. Good. Good. You all should. And, um, well, this is another thing that's interesting about this new opera is only a few people ha in the whole world have seen this score. That's like really um, a beautiful thing. So for those who haven't seen it, Josh Foy, who's our music director and our conductor, can you tell everybody why this opera is so hard? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> yes, the folks are watching. Uh, so, so Leslie um, it des described this piece as a fusion uh, of sorts, and you, you kind of get that sense of it. There's a lot of funk, um, lots of quotes in there. Um, I think there's a bit of South oh, South Pacific, I think is one of the uh, bits in there. And a couple of the like, popular R&B tunes wow. um, that are scattered here and there. And uh, the writing is very similar to big band writing, uh, especially in Wood Winds, um, a lot of punches here and there. Um, and the, the harmony is using a lot of extended chords and it's particularly for the Vocalists, they have to sort of fit in that harmony. Sometimes they're singing ninths, sometimes elevenths. It's hard to get in there. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely rooted in our history, musically. Um, so it's definitely not far removed um, from uh, it being pulled off. It's just seeing all this sort of, uh, sort of maelstrom of material put into one, this, this one piece and trying to make sense of it all. Um, and thank goodness, <laughs> Uh, the, the ensemble size is uh, manageable, um, and I, I, be, I believe that was due to the original commission. Um, but it allowed the voices to come through. Uh, the structure of the piece is also different because most of it is basically a monologue for each of us. Uh, Thug being the longest, I think it's about, it was 30 minutes. <laughs> it was 30 minutes. We, we got it down to about 25. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. It's, it's manageable for everybody. Um, but it, it, I always, when I come across a new piece, as a, either as a, as a conductor or a performer, uh, there's a level of interaction one has to have. And this is a living document, much like what the subject matter is covering. And there's a lot that the composer will bring to the table, but then you have to put in your own interpretation. Hopefully, it will be pleasurable to the composer yeah. who's watching. Yeah. Not nervous at all, <laughs> all at all about it. <laughs> um, but uh, that that fusion of sorts of people, going back to that fusion, is always entertaining, um, always exciting, a little nerve-wracking, but always pleasurable. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, yes, and I think you brought up another very unique thing about this opera, which you all now know. It's all monologues. So I wanted to ask um, uh, Josh Shaw, have you ever directed something in this format before or even brought anything to pop in this format? And how is that different from what you've usually done? No, I, I don't think we've ever, I don't think I've ever directed an opera in this format at all. Um, and uh, it was different. I mean, to be honest, it made scheduling a breeze because it's like you come for an hour and, and then you come for an hour and then we'll get together one or two times. So that that was great. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges to just uh, when you're one person out there, you're you're it. So we tried to give them things to help, uh, you know, tell the story. But uh, really, it's these five people doing all the heavy lifting in this one. Um, any questions from the audience? We have time for a few. I can't see you. Yes, please. Hi, Francisco. Hi. <laughs> so, um, one of you has spoken about this, but the opera singers are used to singing about tragedies. This one is more intense because of the case of our uh, living history. And there's so much that people will delve into and not absorb, and some will require a lot of you to have in order to survive the evening. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about my process. Um, so I am a mother. I have a 19-year-old. Um, and so to Sierra's point earlier, um, you don't really have to dig deep to connect to the stories. My process was more of a, you know, as you mentioned, putting the firewalls, putting the boundaries in place. Um, because as I started to work, I started to notice faces of family members, like faces of cousins coming up, and I put a hard stop to that because I refused to energetically entertain that in my role preparation because I believe that what we do and what we sing about is very powerful. And so I was like, no, we don't need to go there. Um, and so I'm not singing about, you know, I, so I had the, the privilege of joining Sierra in, um, in Knoxville with Marble City Opera. And when we worked there, the, uh, thank you, um, the director there uh, also does a lot of work with, um, with veterans dealing with trauma. And so one of the conversations that he brought was this process of when you're finished, just physically shaking it out and saying, this is not my story, this is not my story. Um, and I did have to pull that back, uh, pull that practice back up. Um, and so one way that I did that was I refused to connect it directly to my life. Um, and I don't have to, because the humanity of these people, the, the genius of this, uh, this writing is that it is, for me, the first time we really get to know the mother as a holistic person and not just when we meet her on the other side of the, the press podium, 
when she's crying next to the, the lawyer, the civil rights activist, asking and crying for justice for her child. You know, we get the chance to hear about her life and her dreams that she had for herself, the regular tragedy, right, that she experienced, and then how she translate those dreams to her son. And this is a mother, period. And so, um, yeah, I, I was intentional about not allowing it to be too close. Um, and it still got me, so. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Anyone else have anything? Yes, please. Um, Don't be shy. We're all friends. Well, yeah, I mean, we, uh, this project came to pop uh, a while ago now, almost two years ago, I, I would say. Um, and, you know, at the time, it was, just seemed so relevant, you know, we just, I couldn't pass it up. And then here we are, it's just as relevant this week. So, um, it was just something we felt, yeah, uh, if you're not familiar with pop, we don't usually do shows like this. It's a lot of jokes and, and silliness. Uh, but, you know, when something comes along that's important, and you're in a place where you can do it, you should do it. And that's, that's what we did. And I'm glad we did. Yeah. Me too. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess just speaking for myself, um, I know, unfortunately, many of my amazing colleagues have had to deal firsthand with a lot of these issues. And um, me, not so much, uh, but it felt really important to me because these are, you know, they're not just stories for the black community or, you know, people of color. These are American stories, um, and we all need to get involved in the discussion, um, especially the white community really needs to get involved in the discussion. Thank you. Hello, I'm, my name is Orson, and um, I played the athlete, at least the best that I could dribble that ball. <laughs> We're just going to leave it at that. Um, I, I'm proud of, um, of all of my colleagues. I'm, I'm proud of um, Josh and Pop for taking on this um, monumental discussion that is rooted at the very foundations of our nation, and um, you know, we, we, we talked backstage about this. It's a cyclical conversation um, 
where you feel like you're, in art, what we try to do is imbue real life scenarios uh, with beauty. Uh, and I said this the other night that, you know, opera is, is living history and this is no different. Although stomaching it is a little different than the romantic uh, operas and canons that we're used to. Um, I come of mixed heritage, um, so I had a unique perspective growing up. Um, and when I decided to become an opera singer, I, uh, I never knew that I would be doing something like this. That wasn't the goal because what we live every day, uh, we try not to hash out on stage, right? And all of us have that on varying degrees and levels, depending on where you're at, blue states, red states, you know, it, it varies, but you're aware. And I always say that, you know, we live these different avatars, you know, you, you did not have a choice in the avatar that you were, you know, created with. Um, and so you have your own unique experience. And um, I think it's a testament to see some of the faces out here that um, are interested and I think the most powerful thing that we can do is, is take what we experienced today and, and, and go tell somebody and have that conversation with your loved ones because that's really the only way that that's going to change is if you start to exemplify the change that you want to see in your own life um, and having that uncomfortable conversation so that we can all live our best lives. And um, yeah, this was, this was an, an honor for, uh, to take on the role for my particular uh, I don't want to say character because it was a real life person or many faces uh, that have gone through similar um, um, murders. Um, mine was based loosely on Trayvon Martin. And um, my approach was not so much of a firewall because I tried to focus on the humanity of the person that he was up until the last moment. Um, and so in doing that, I think that we honor the people that um, have passed away. And we hope that this will end, um, but it will take our collective effort in order to do that. Thank you. Probably have time for about one more. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming far and wide. Um, and this performance today is being live streamed. So um, we would love it if you would, you know, go back to your communities, the people close to you, and be able to be very vulnerable and say, you know, I understand now because I learned this way. I think that's okay sometimes to say, you know, I wasn't really sure what we've been trying to say throughout our whole existence, but this sort of showed me a way to better understand it. Um, and also, this work is new, as you just heard from our, our friends at another company, and so we always try to amplify new opera works. Um, so please invite others to participate in this beautiful thing we did today. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. How many more? That's the question that we must ask ourselves as we go into our lives today. How many more? That was I Can't Breathe, a new opera from composer Leslie Burrs and librettist Brandon J. Gibson. A big thank you to the cast and creative team for speaking with me during this performance. Many thanks, of course, to the El Portal Theater for hosting this incredible premiere. A big thanks to our technical team, including Rob Webb, Matt Welch, and David Hobbs for their invaluable assistance with this live stream. And most importantly, thank you 
for your continued patronage of Pacific Opera Project, for hearing this incredible new opera, for supporting these voices, and for being with us throughout the years. We can't do what we do without you. To learn more about I Can't Breathe, I invite you to check out my conversation with Brandon Gibson and Leslie Burrs, available through Pop's own podcast series called Poppercast. In the coming weeks, I'll be speaking with A.D. Josh Shaw about Pop's 2022-23 season, as well as Into the Woods. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast to get alerts for when new episodes go up. And speaking of Into the Woods, tickets are selling out fast for those performances. It opens July 7th. I say go get those tickets right now because they will sell out. I'm Jennifer Miller-Hamill. Again, thank you so much for tuning in.